Well, good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Planning for Quality in Your Medical Device Clinical Trials. My name is Andrew Jordan, and I'll be your X Talks host for today. And today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes with time for a question and answer session with our speakers. And this webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and your comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, and that's on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, you can contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. And please note that this event will be recorded and made available for you for future streaming. And at this point, I'd like to thank Premier Research, who developed the content for this presentation. Premier Research, a mid-size clinical research company, is dedicated to helping biotech, specialty pharma, and device innovators transform life-changing ideas and breakthrough science into new medical treatments. As a global company, Premier specializes in the use of innovative technologies for smart study design and trial management to deliver clean, conclusive data to sponsors. Whether it's developing product lifecycle strategies, reducing clinical development cycle times, securing access to patients, navigating global regulations, maximizing the impact of limited rare disease data, or providing expertise in specific therapeutic areas, Premier is committed to helping its customers answer the unmet needs of patients across a broad range of medical conditions. All right, well, I'd like now to introduce your speakers for today's webinar. Kirsten Wells is currently working as a project leader at Premier Research, focusing on medical device studies. Her main therapeutic experience is in cardiology with special focus on interventional cardiology to treat coronary artery diseases, mitral valve insufficiencies, and atrial fibrillations. Since 2013, she worked as a clinical project manager at NAMSA, fully dedicated to clinical market and post-market medical device studies, conducted mainly in the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific. And next to her project management role, she was also involved in medical writing, site auditing, regulatory activities, and acted as a trainer for sites and CRO staff. All right, and your second speaker for today, Vicki Gashweiler, joined Premier Re Research early, earlier this year uh, as the Executive Director of Strategic Development in the Medical Device and Diagnostics Group. She brings 15 years of experience in the medical device industry, both from the sponsor and CRO sides. Vicky, Vicky has extensive understanding of complex trial execution on a global scale, diverse team management, and global regulatory processes and timelines. Just over four years ago, Vicky moved from the sponsor side at Abbott Vascular to the CRO side, joining first Novella Clinical and now with Premier Research. Vicky has experience in oncology and dermatologic devices, endocrinology, weight management, orthopedics, as well as extensive cardi cardiac and vascular device trials. She brings a high level of understanding of market development and trends, as well as a deep therapeutic knowledge of many disease processes and the clinical trials to intervene upon them. All right, and before we get started, I'd like to launch a polling question for the audience. Uh, and you can vote on this poll question in real time by clicking on your screen. And I encourage you to do so right now. The question is, rather, I am, maybe you're part of a manufacturing company, part of a CRO, uh, or maybe you're self-employed. So again, you can vote on this question in real time by clicking on your screen, getting most clicks in now. Thanks, everyone, for voting. Let's close this poll now and take a look at the results. All right, there we have it. 60% of you saying that you're part of a manufacturing company, 23% saying part of a CRO, and 17% of you are self-employed. 
interesting results. Thanks everyone for voting on that polling question. Now, I'd like to hand the microphone and the presentation over to your first speaker for today, and that's Kirsten Wells. Kirsten. Kirsten, you're just muted on your own end there. You might have to unmute yourself. Okay, <laughs> better now? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the very nice introduction. I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm wonderful. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk today together with my uh, colleague, Vicky. And we want to speak about planning for quality in your medical device trials. Today, we will address this topic via the concept of RBM, risk-based monitoring. Um, for those of you who are already a little bit uh, in the industry, you may remember that RVM was a very hot topic around the 2010, 2011. So everybody was talking about this and how to get this implemented in a study. At the moment, it got quite more attention again to the revision of the ICHGCP E6 R2 guideline, um, which is more a pharma guidance document, and uh, this area is already addressing RBM more than what the, the medical device world is doing. But also for us here with the medical devices, this will get more attention as currently our GCP clinical study standard ISO 14155 is under revision. The draft is already published and uh, the RBM concept will come into focus here as well. Why are we picking this up, um, this concept of RBM right now? What we can see from our daily practice is that the big medical device manufacturers and companies have adopted this concept already to a good degree. But for the smaller companies, um, and, and these are the majorities of, of the medical device companies in the world, um, it is still a bit foreign, this concept. But it's pretty good to pick this important topic up again and shed some light here as it can do so much for us all. So this is why today's talk circulates around the facts, why the implementation of RBM into a medical device trial has several advantages. So now we start with the journey. I hope I can advance the slides. Ah, yes, here you go. Before we dive into the risk-based monitoring language and what it brings about, let's speak first about study ecology and associated costs. Um, I just did a simple look at clinicaltrials.gov to get an idea how many studies are ongoing. And I think clinicaltrials.gov is the biggest registry, registry database. So at the moment, there are 290 studies registered. And this is all. You know, it's medical device and pharma. You cannot really discriminate this between the both, but you get a nice picture what is observational and what is interventional. So the majority is is interventional. It is also difficult to get figures about associated costs in medical device studies, but you get nice figures for the pharma studies, and I think we can leverage some of the, the facts here to our medical device world as well. So when you look into pharma studies, for the small phase one studies, the budgets are on average between 1.4 to 6 million, whilst the phase two study, which is a bit bigger, is between seven to 19 million, and the very big studies with the thousands of subjects in uh, can cost up to 52 million of dollars. So, but let's say so we, we, we assume just an average of seven million dollar when you do some simple math, and you multiply this with the number of ongoing studies, you get the impressive sum of 2,300, 2030 billion US dollar for clinical studies. To give you an idea, the, the complete gross national income of Germany in, in 2018 was uh, 3,620 billion US dollar. So it's a huge, huge volume. And it's in, interesting to look more closer what are the cost items here? How is the budget broken down? In this table, I have highlighted, and guess what? I am talking about risk-based monitoring, those items which are associated with the monitoring. There are other patient-related costs, uh, patient-physician costs, uh, IRB costs, um, which 
constitute the whole study budget. But now we talk about the site monitoring costs. And here in this table, you see that for a phase one study, um, on average, you have 9.33% of the budget is applicable for the site monitoring costs. In the somehow bigger phase two studies, it's increasing to 14.25, and phase three is uh, equivalent. Um, on top of this, you also need to add source data verification costs, which means that you really compare the data on site with the data which are captured in the patient database, the case report forms. So this adds again to the costs um, for the single phases of the studies. You can say on average that um, 20 to 25 percent of a study budget accounts for monitoring or SDV costs. Um, there are also some sources which even speak about 30 percent which are applicable for on-site monitoring visits. So to look at monitoring costs and the idea of changing the um, way how you do it makes sense because you want to see if the costs are still uh, justifying um, the effort and the outcome in the end in terms of data quality and patient safety. So cost is one aspect, but also the regulators noticed uh, when they did their inspections and audits that even when you do traditional on-site monitoring and turn around each piece of paper, you will still have mistakes in the database. And they acknowledge this by saying, okay, we don't need to have it perfect. And they are embracing um, the risk-based approach to monitoring. Um, so let's have a little refresher on the available guidance documents. Um, I think first pioneering was the FDA here in this scenario. They had released a guidance for industry where sponsors can uh, get uh, support in how to, to develop risk-based monitoring for their studies. It is a very solid guidance document which gives good insights um, in how to approach this. Then I just said that recently the ICHE6 guidance document was uh, updated to R2. And this, um, this guideline especially um, highlights the need for a quality management approach including the risk-based monitoring and also the support of supports the use of new technology. Um, just to give you one little example how, how this expresses um, in real life when I say that regulatory bodies or guidance bodies are embracing the risk-based approach. When you develop nowadays a monitoring plan which is according to the E6 R2 guidance, you really need to justify your monitoring strategy. If you decide to do all monitoring on site and to really review 100% of data points, you need to find a justification. If you do risk based, you need to do it as well. So, this is really changing. Um, the ICHGCP E6 guideline is not fully applicable for medical devices. We have our own standard, the 14155. Um, but this is currently not addressing um, risk very detailed, but it's changing and you will see, so you, you can already review the draft, it's on the ISO homepage, you can buy it. Um, it, will, it will cover the risk-based approach as well, next to other very interesting and important changes. I could expand on this a little bit longer, but maybe this is a topic for another seminar. Well, um, one thing that I'd yes. like to mention about 100% source data verification, now that we have much more care available to patients, it's very unlikely that you'll truly see 100% of their patient record. There's so many avenues for them to seek care, whether it's urgent care at a hospital, a different hospital than they went to for the treatment. So I think this risk-based approach takes that in mind as we track patient information in its, you know, 2019. Yes, yeah, so right, Vicky. So, right, and uh, just to, to mention the last guidance here on that slide is the European Medicines Agency, uh, which 
prepared a reflection paper on risk-based quality management in clinical trials. So from a regulatory perspective, RBM is not only embraced, but somehow expected more or less. So we will focus on the monitoring part um, in a second. We do now a little sidestep and talk about risk-based quality management system and how this all ties together to have our terminology straight. So um, we will speak now about risk. So the most, or I would say medical device manufacturers are pretty familiar with the term risk because it's well known from the ISO 14971 risk management. And the risk is defined as the probability of harm occurring multiplied by the severity of the harm occurring or when the harm occurs. So how bad is an issue when it happens? And this is um, addressed in this risk-based quality management system. So you start by really thinking things through. Um, so it starts with information gathering for risks identification, and those risks can come from several levels. It can come from the site level, patient level, operational risks, risks associated with the computer systems you're using, uh, the protocol. So all this needs to go into this big think tank. And once you, you have all gathered, you need to evaluate things. If they really matter, how good are you able to identify this? What are my thresholds, the tolerance limits? So there's a lot of upfront thinking uh, necessary to, to come up with this. Next step in this process is the risk control. Then you go and have a look if the risk is, is acceptable. If it's not acceptable, you need to do something about it. So you need to reduce the risk. And this is mostly done via risk mitigation. And uh, you define acceptance level. And this is all then addressed in the risk management plan. And you come up with quality tolerance limits or thresholds. This will get implemented then, and then you look at the risk again, and then you check, is the risk now acceptable? If no, you repeat the step. If yes, you move on. And then you look at the stage of the trial. So this is an ongoing process, starting before the study even starts, and continues till the end of the study. Is your study already done? You will report on all this in your clinical study report and prepare a final risk management report. If your study is ongoing, you will do a risk review on a regular basis. So you will review the events, but you will also be on the watch out if you identify new risks which haven't been noticed beforehand. So this all is the overarching overall approach of a risk-based quality management system. When we talk about RBM, risk-based monitoring, it is just part a piece of the pie of risk management, and it falls under risk control as a mitigation strategy. So the risk is, is your data reliable? And you add the monitoring part to it, your data become more reliable. So this is the risk control. So when we talk about RBM, it's just part of the bigger thing. Now we move on to the risk-based monitoring, the full picture. This is a concept built out of four different pillars. And it's also only possible because we live in these modern times. When I started with clinical research, there was no EDC, no electronic database. We all had paper CRFs. So to have a remote, real-time review of data wasn't possible. We needed to go to the sites, collect the paper CRF pages, and bring it to data management. Nowadays, with having all the databases, we can, I don't know, pull the data from all different corners and look at them and, and do analyses. And this is exactly what the centralized monitoring is about. It's a remote evaluation of aggregated data whilst applying some statistical methods to it so that the data becomes storytelling. I will not dive into this too much because my colleague Vicky will speak about this uh, in a second. But this is one of the heartbeats when we speak about uh, risk-based monitoring. It's pretty essential. The next pillar here in this picture is the reduced monitoring so, or reduced source data verification. 
This is actually sometimes also deployed without centralized monitoring when you have a standard of care registry, which is a simple data collection. You may be good when you only want to have a certain degree or percentage of your data reviewed and not all. So you will go less on-site uh, and you will mainly not review all data points, but focus on those which are critical. So critical data, what are critical data? Critical data are those which are affecting the patient safety and the ethical concepts like GCP. So you want for sure check if all the informed consent forms were signed. You for sure want to check if, uh, if the endpoints are right. But you may be a bit more relaxed when you go to the demographics and, and you capture patient weight. If the patient now weighs 55, kilograms or 52 might not be so super critical. So this is what you do when you do reduced monitoring. You're focusing on a certain number of data points and there you ensure that they are right. Um, the next one, the targeted or triggered monitoring is immediately tied into the centralized monitoring aspect because what the central monitor will do, he or she will review the data and they may see a trend or a signal. Uh, and this is all predefined before you actually do the work. And this trigger will trigger then an activity which is also predefined. A nice example is always when you have, for example, a site, a, a study with 10 study sites. It's a complex indication, high comorbidity. You would expect at least three to four SAEs per patient. And then you have nine sites which report on average, I don't know, two SAEs. Um, and then there's one site where you see zero or only very little. This would be a typical case which could trigger an on-site visit where you definitely want to go there and check out if something is happening there, if all is appropriate. The last um, step here to complete this picture is remote monitoring. Um, this is a very general definition. It's an approach whereby activities done uh, remotely, which are usually done on site in the past. And uh, we have the situation, for example, in the US, where the hospital electronic uh, systems are allowing remote access to the medical records. So it's 21 part 11 compatible. The monitor gets a separate login and can only review study data. So they can sit at home actually, have a look at the patient charter and uh, compare this what is in the, in the EDC system. So this is a typical example of, of uh, remote cross checks. In Europe, we rarely can do this because uh, we don't have this access to the sites at many hospitals. So nevertheless, we do remote checks. Yes. You're exactly right though. Europe has a limited access to health records and it actually is less widely accepted in the US than we thought we would see. You know, 10 years ago, we thought everyone would have a Google chart that you could go to and we'd be able to eliminate monitoring in general by the time we got to 2020. And I think we've seen that there's less buy-in from local and regional hospitals to say, yes, I trust that my patient's data is, is truly safe. So this, this type of model for monitoring through um, electronic medical records has actually been less successful than we thought it would be. Yeah, which is a bad, for, for, from our perspective, a bit bad. But uh, we will see what the future will bring, yeah. So it always takes a bit to adopt new strategies. Indeed. Um, but even though when you don't have access to the medical records in the hospital system, you can do a lot of things remote, uh, like checking if, if um, follow-up visits which were due are really done and, and enter the data. You can see if, if there are eventually non-compliances with the protocol in terms of patient visits. Um, you can do a lot even when you don't have any uh, source documentation. So, but uh, this is uh, the famous four who, who form up the full picture of risk-based monitoring, the centralized monitoring, reduced monitoring, targeted monitoring, and remote monitoring. So this is the RBM concept. What we are now going to do is we do a little comparison 
of the traditional on-site monitoring versus the risk-based monitoring. I already said in the in the past um, we didn't have a diff other chance than by going to the site and doing a visit and collecting the data. And this is still yeah traditionally practiced throughout our industry to a certain degree. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it's eventually just because the new approach is not adopted. So, but in this approach, you define up front a number of visits, you go to the site and mainly all sites and patient data are treated equally because you aim to have everything cleaned up and 100% data error free. So you go to site A five times, site B five times, site C five times, and you look at everything. In reality, that does not make super much sense always. I need to be careful because it depends also on the study design. Um, because we all know that some sites will be high enroller, some sites will be low enroller. So it would be more smart to go those to those sites which have a high number of patients enrolled more frequent than to that one which has just two patients. Also, we know there will always be some sites which are really good and, and deliver a very nice and decent job whilst another site might be overloaded with work or the study coordinator has left and it's a bit all unorganized so this may require more on-site visits and also here the on-site visits can vary yeah you can define how much sdv you're looking into uh, if it's a sloppy site you may want to sdv more while it's a super performing site you may want to review less and here the site and patient data are treated according to their risk. If all is good and there is no harm um, expected to any way of interpreting the data, um, then, then this is according to the risk, uh, low risk. So aim is here to have the data fit for purpose. Okay, some more comments on the traditional on-site monitoring. Um, I already said that this uh, approach is, is a little bit like being perfect. We don't want to have any issue with our data quality, therefore we do everything. And I already said that uh, inspectors found errors in 100% SDB data. Yeah, we are not perfect. And there's also some literature out there where they have done an interesting study um, they, they checked what a large random transcription error with a frequency of up to 5% in the ECRF would do with the data. And they noticed that it wouldn't significantly influence the outcome of the trial. So 5% is quite huge. So do we really need to be perfect here? Um, and now we need to come from a different angle. Um, there are facts and literature out there who speak that the time a monitor spends on site to do the source data verification can take up to 75% of the monitoring visit, which means the person really sits there digging into the charts, not interacting at all, just comparing what is in the chart with what is in the EDC system. Other sources speak of a little bit less, but however, this would mean that the remaining time is very little to do all the other for me, also very important tasks. And uh, for example, to review the study processes at the site, to discuss with the study team, uh, yeah, how things are done, where are hiccups. Also just establish a very good relationship with the site team because you spend time with them. You will retrain them. You will review jointly the investigator site file to see if everything is in compliance. So you will spend 75% of the time to do a retrospective approach to fix things which are already gone wrong, like the errors in the EDC. And you just have 25% to be proactive. And I think to shift the focus here more to have time with the site staff uh, would be more proactive because you can train them, you can discuss processes and thereby help to support, uh, to prevent non-compliance in the first instance. So, Kirsten, I think that's a fantastic point to park on for a moment. Um, we, send, we spend a lot of money um, as clinical research progresses sending CRAs to hospitals, having them review data, and what we're missing out on is the big picture. 
and, and the big picture includes where we're touching these patients, understanding with these research coordinators and investigators how a patient is flowing through their site. And occasionally you can, we, we've had our CRAs at sites that have found a missed protocol deviation reporting or adverse event reporting because there was a place that the patients were being seen and we weren't able to capture that because the, the research coordinators were focused on data instead of where are we touching the patient. If the patient's coming back into the clinic for a follow-up visit, say, sometimes the research coordinators and the PIs weren't aware. So when we can sit down with these sites and really see how the flow of their day goes for these patients and where they're interacting with them, it's so much more value than it is looking from chart to EDC and chart to EDC. Yeah, this is exactly what, what my message is here. What is the value of the time on site? Yeah, and where do you want to invest this? Um, I, I certainly, I, I could add to the stories uh, tons and tons and tons <laughs> of my experience. But, uh, for the sake of time, I will move on. <laughs> okay, I do think we have a polling question now. That's right, Kirsten. So that polling question is appearing on your screens again. This is the second and final polling question of the day. Uh, have you used any form of risk-based monitoring in the past or maybe even currently? Uh, your options there, of course, just yes, no, or maybe you're unsure about that. Uh, have you used any form of risk-based monitoring in the past or even currently? Uh, looks like most of you are voting on this. Thanks for doing so. Give you another couple seconds here to get your clicks in to vote, and then we'll close the poll and have a look at the results. And let's do that right now. There we have it, 76% of you saying yes, 13% uh, saying no, and 11% of you are unsure about that. All right, interesting results. Thanks everyone for voting on that. And with that, Kirsten, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so implementing risk-based monitoring in a clinical study, how are we going to do this then now, having thought about this, that might be a useful concept. So to do this in a meaningful manner, first we really need to sit down and plan and think. Usually it starts with a RECT, the Risk Assessment and Categorization Tool. And this is really where the collective intelligence needs to come together. So operations, uh, monitoring, data management, stats, safety, they all should put efforts into the identification of, of potential risks and also categorize them into the likelihood and the impact and also the detectability of such an uh, untoward event and what would be the risk mitigation here. And, and all this will result in a couple of plans, some call it quality and risk plan, but there are also other names. But in the end, it's all the same. You will define critical data and processes you will define risk indicators. How can you notice these? Yeah, uh, You will develop some system tools, how to capture it, how to review it, and all this will go into plans. And you will also create a monitoring plan where you define on-site, off-site activities. So this is the planning phase. And then you start doing. Yeah, So you have a central monitor who is reviewing the data and looks if there are certain thresholds are met and if there are certain activities triggered by this. Um, so that's, this is one part. You will have routine on-site monitoring as a standard, but also the targeted ones to do SDV and site management and also perform remote monitoring. And this is not a one-time thing, but this is a typical plan, do, check, act cycle. So you will plan, you will do, and then you will do the sanity check, and then you may need to adjust your plans. Eventually, your risk indicators were too rough or too limited, um, so you need to reassess this. This is a living process throughout the study, but it will give you a wonderful grip on, on your, your study data. And I think now it's time to move over, having had a bit of theory, to see such a system more in, in, in life. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, Vicky. Thanks, Kirsten. So I'll be talking a little bit about what risk-based monitoring actually looks like 
at Premier and how we manage this this tool that we have that that is so useful and and really helps reduce risk for trials. Um, so the system basically is the spinal cord. It, it passes all the information to all from all pieces of the clinical trial. Um, it, it really allows a central view and the ability to manage quality proactively. Um, it, it's able to pull data and information from, obviously, from the EDC system, the CTMS system, which is our clinical trial management system. Additionally, we can pull from things such as uh, randomization system, um, core laboratories, which is really, really helpful if we're doing, say, a diabetic study to understand where we're tracking the ranges for capillary blood sugar, things like that, even a hypertension study or a radiology study for an orthopedic patient as well. So I think that this is a really great picture on the bottom. It's a little small, but we'll show you a few bigger, bigger images. It just demonstrates that it brings it all together and allows us to say, set levels of where we see risk. Kirsten, did you have something to add? I think you captured all nicely. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, that'd be great. I am already there. Wonderful. So as Kirsten mentioned, this is our risk assessment and categorization tool at the beginning of each study where we meet, sit down with every customer to review what are our primary risks. And it's best if we can do this earlier rather than later. Our ideal situation is to do it at the protocol planning phase to help be successful in what we're implementing into the trial design to allow us to manage risk and also proactively manage risk when we are executing the study. It takes into consideration agreed upon values. So it, as you can see here in fairly small font, it looks at the complexity of a trial. Are we looking at a patient's, say, blood pressure measurement, or are we looking at their ejection fraction? Those are two very different complexities in where you're gathering that data. It also takes into consideration endpoints. Are we looking at uh, a simple assessment such as a temperature, was the was, uh, temperature raised or lowered, or are we looking at something more complex, which is the ability to decrease um, congestive heart failure symptoms and be able to walk further. It, it really helps us determine what we, how we want to manage this risk. And it's great because it's not a one-time thing, as Kirsten mentioned. This is a really living, breathing process. And I think we have the ability to interact on issues as they arise. Let's go to the next slide. So we'll actually look at a couple different levels that we'll, you'll be able to see when we're utilizing this software. This one is a higher level. It's really across the entire study. And the example here is protocol deviations. I think this is ob the fairly obvious point that we would use risk-based monitoring for and keeping in mind that we're assuming our sites are entering deviations proactively. Um, pieces of our risk-based monitoring help to trigger queries and an understanding of was there a deviation and was it missed. But I think the key here for deviation management is let's say that there was a required treatment. Let's give an example of say post dilating a stent. If we're seeing trends that that deviation is occurring and it's not happening, that can impact our endpoint significantly if required for the device. This allows us a tool to see study-wide issues and be able to proactively prevent them from occurring again at all sites by doing either a retraining or occasionally it helps us to say, we need a protocol amendment because this deviation is happening and it's not critical to the endpoint of the study and it's low risk. So those are things we can look at at a study level. And then next slide, Kristen. Great. So at a site level, this gives example of queries. Queries can really be a health indicator of a site and how they're managing their patient data. Um, it can really help us drill down and see how, how proactively they're entering data, how proactively they're responding to queries. And, and as I mentioned, the health at a site related to queries helps us determine if they're not engaged what else are they not engaged on, right? Queries seem like a simple issue. However, if we see a site that's very slow to enter data in general, slow to respond to queries, it does trigger us to have a little more interaction with the site, not necessarily 
okay, we have to fly out to the site immediately. However, let's engage the site a few more times per week if, if that's going to help them and measure how, where that was successful or not. And then determine, okay, it's time for a monitoring visit. We really need to understand what's happening on a site level. Next slide. So this is really the grain of sand of, of each clinical trial, this patient data, and looking through trends for the patient, where we're actually at in the context of that patient's continuum of care. Um, as everyone is aware, device studies tend to have very long follow-up periods, and it's because a lot of the devices we're utilizing are permanently implanted, and we need to follow them to see if there's any long-term adverse events. This really helps sum up where your patient's issues are occurring. Were they missing visits? What's, what's happening there? What does the site do to ensure the patient compliance and coming back for their next visit? Um, additionally, this gives the example of a blood pressure me uh, measurement, which I think is really helpful. If, for instance, we're working on a hypertensive, de antihypertensive device trial, uh, we need to understand if that patient is trending towards a higher blood pressure level, and what are we doing about it? A lot of studies that we utilize currently have electronic patient reported outcomes where they're entering their information real time. This tool pulls all of that information together and allows us to say, hmm, patient two at site five appears to be trending very high. What is the site doing to engage this patient? And is there a risk for an event that we can preemptively manage by having the site contact that patient or bring them in. So I think this is a really great snapshot of the detailed drill down assessments that can be gathered in this risk-based monitoring software. Kirsten, yes. I think I'll pass back to you. Uh, yeah, and just to add, it is really impressive what such uh, RBM softwares can do to help you visualize data points which are of special interest and, and to look at data in an aggregated view. Um, because it's so different to how a monitor looks at the data when being on site, you just see isolated data points at the site. But a person looking at the aggregated data points at a study level may see signals which a single monitor cannot detect, which would be even difficult for data managers in line listings. So this tool allows you real-time data qualification or quality review and this is only possible because of all the modern new systems we have in place so I, th I think it was very nice that you showed us a little bit about how to drill down in in such a software and uh, we could show more but I think we would uh, blow up our time <laughs> indeed thanks Vicky okay going back to the concept so status quo, where, where are we right now with RBM? Having in mind it started in 2010. So we know that this concept is more adopted in pharmaceutical studies and for medical device studies, it's mainly the large manufacturers who are using this. And here, this is also a very important statement that not all drug studies will deploy this, but it's at the moment only 25%. And this also depends on the study design and the length of the study. It doesn't make sense necessarily um, to implement RBM when you have a study which is really short in, in duration, uh, meaning it comes to an end after, I don't know, nine months. It also doesn't make sense necessarily when you only have 20 patients in because how much storytelling will your aggregated data review be then? Now with so limited data. So you, it really needs to be evaluated. Does make RBM sense or not? And is it an advantage? If you determine though, because your study is big enough and long enough, it makes always sense. Um, also, they looked into uh, who, uh, what, what are the reasons for adopting RBM? And there is this US uh, consortium called Metrics Champion Consortium. And they had sent out a survey and 41 respondents uh, reported why they have done so. So the main reason is really to reduce monitoring costs. But I think the equal important reason is to improve data quality and quality oversight. And I think this is super important 
because it's not only about reducing potentially the costs, it is more um, how to improve quality in your studies. And here comes now a very last example that RBM is not dangerous <laughs> for your data. Um, there was a study done, it was a prospective randomized study called Adaman study, where they have taken 213 sites from 11 academic uh, trials, and those were cluster randomized to either on-site monitoring or risk-based monitoring method. And then they have done post-trial audits and they checked the data in terms of frequency of major GCP findings at patient level. And this study concluded then that the risk-based monitoring is non-inferior to extensive on-site monitoring. So the quality was equal, but the cost was significantly different. So here, and I think it's quite some, some huge uh, study, 213 sites. Um, so it's storytelling. Yeah, and last but not least, uh, it may not be deployed too often right now, but it will come because it's expected to be utilized by the regulators. So that's the status quo. And uh, once again, what are the benefits here? Um, what, why to uh, implement this? We spoke already about the costs. So I don't think, I think that the literature eventually is a little bit too positive to say, we will save up to 15, 20% of costs for a clinical study. If it is so, it's great. Um, but you also need to bear in mind that you need to add uh, RBM software, you need to have a central monitor, so this will also add a little bit um, to the costs. But however, you will have some cost reduction. Um, safety and quality, the way how data are reviewed with this RBM solution really allows uh, real-time review of the data, high-quality review of the data, and whenever there's a corrective action needed, you can implement this immediately, and you don't need to wait uh, what you usually had with a traditional approach where you needed to go first on-site to do anything. Also, it has a very positive influence um, at the end of the study. When you have your study data, you close the study, it usually takes up to three months to clean the databases, and get it ready for the clinical study report. RBM requiring ongoing database cleaning real time and will make your data earlier available. And you know, in a, when, when this is really important for getting CE market, it can make a difference in terms of when you start to earn money with your device. And uh, as already said, it's the expectation uh, that we comply with this. I think one thing to park on as well that you mentioned is the timeline. And it's an important piece. Um, timeline for reporting um, events can be reduced. We can collect information quicker based on that. And I think timeline for approval of the device, that, that's critical, Kirsten, that you mentioned, because that, that means another day, week, month on the market sooner. And I think yes. we all need to take that into consideration. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a benefit to this. It's money and timeline. And, and safety as well, this proactive situation that you're demonstrating to regulatory bodies, that you're planning ahead of time to be able to turn information and risk around so quickly. It, it's just a very great tool and asset for your trial. True. Conclusion. Remember we started with this uh, nice calculation exercise, 2030 billion, and I just wanted to get an understanding what this really means we potentially save 20% of the clinical study budget. This would mean, in this scenario, 406 billion US dollar, which is super virtual. But when you translate this, then you could buy 13.3 million cars each <laughs> $30,000 or 2 million houses each 2,000, 200,000. So it's, it's an incredible sum. And even if it's just 5% saving, it's still very much, although, you know, this calculation may be cheating here. Um, but anyway, so in the light of the medical device regulation we are facing here in Europe, we know that we will get more clinical studies with medical devices, either to get them through the market or to remain them on the market. And in this light of the MDR, it is 
even more important to consider the implementation of RBM for fitting medical device studies to run the, the upcoming studies cost efficient, high quality, so that you generate high quality study data to obtain your CE mark as quick as possible, as Vicky just said, but to get early to the market will help. And sometimes, oh, I would recommend um, if you are as a sponsor not super experienced with this concept, it might be a good idea to partner up with an experienced zero, for example, like Premier Research, mm -hmm. uh, to, to help implementing the RBM um, in an efficient and cost-effective manner so that we can ensure a smooth study conduct and that you really um, generate good data. Last slide. Um, I am really fond of quotes of Albert Einstein, and this I really love. Uh, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And this is why we need to stay open for new approaches. And I do think that RBM will put some requirements up front, but it will help us so much to overcome cost and quality problems. And this concludes the active part of this presentation. I thank you very much for listening. I hand back again to Andrew, right? Great, you do, yes, thank you. Great quote there, uh, also great presentation, lots of insights there. Uh, thanks, Vicky, thanks, uh, Kirsten, for that. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite our audience now to continue sending in their questions and their comments in right now. This, of course, is the Q&A portion of the webinar. And we already have some questions here, so let's get started on our first question. Uh, if monitors don't visit the sites as frequently as uh, they did in the past, does this have a negative influence on the relationship? Now, your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, this is this is actually one of the questions I, I come across most when I speak about RBM. Does it influence the the relationship? Yeah, where we don't go so frequent to the site. And and you know, it is uh, as always a, in in life when you have a uh, a good performing site which is doing the study with the right interest and right resources, they will do the study anyway in a good fashion, if I go there or not. Yeah, and not to go there doesn't mean that we don't interact with the site. We call them, we exchange emails whenever they have questions, we are there. The relationship management comes more into focus uh, when you have a site which is poorly performing, then even in the scenario of RVM, the monitor would go more there, there more frequent than to the other sites to help and to, to, to resolve the issues. So you will have more targeted SDV. So I would say, uh, no, it will not have necessarily a negative influence, but we really need to also stress the fact that we should still allow enough time for site management, having calls and exchanges. I hope well, this answers the question. <laughs> well, one thing I'd like to add to a lot of sites historically depended on their CRA to cue them. Um, basically, they would know, okay, next week my monitor is coming, so I have to enter all of this data. This process does put some responsibility back on the sites, but in a way it's empowering because we're able to help them real time with the data and not make it so that we're taking up eight hours of a day saying this was missed, you didn't do this, 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 so we can do it live and update data um, in general as we go. Right, okay, makes sense. Thanks for that. Um, another question here for you, is there a cost benefit by utilizing uh, RBM uh, in ePremier? Yeah, this is uh, again one of the questions which you cannot always say yes and no. <laughs> it depends so much on the study. If it's a small study and you add another study system, it may blow up your budget. If it's a study of a certain size with a certain number of, of patients, the costs may level out uh, by reducing the on site monitoring frequency and adding another system. Um, so you will for sure have some cost efficiencies, but I think it makes things too easy to just reduce the RBM concept and, and the way of doing it to saving costs, because you also need to 
bear in mind that it's important to to have this this data quality aspect in this address as well that the data become more reliable more real life more valid uh, when you deploy this concept so i would say uh, yes and no <laughs> i agree all right, thanks for that. Um, and let's have at least one more question here. Uh, which criteria should be considered when trying to identify the best suited central monitoring system uh, for, for my study? Uh, this is one for you. <laughs> right, well, I think we need to look at it first from a patient safety angle, then after that, an endpoint angle, and then after that, compliance. I mean, I would put them in that order um, and, and occasionally they're interchangeable, but I think we really need to look at how we're managing data from each system, whether it's from the EDC system or, um, as I mentioned, the imaging system and the lab system. Wh which of those is going to trip us first, um, I think, is what we need to look at. Um, ePremier really provides a really great environment to do this simply that helps the CRAs be more efficient with their time and really helps the relationship between the sites as far as determining what risk we should assess. So I, I do think it's safety, compliance, and endpoints um, in, in some variation of their order, depending on what we're doing for the study. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Vicki. Also, thank you to, to Kirsten. Uh, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. Uh, but if we weren't able to attend to your questions today, the team at Premier Research may try to follow up with you after the webinar. And if you do have some questions uh, that you didn't get to ask today, uh, I encourage you to reach out to the email address showing on your screen right now. That's info at premier-research.com. And thanks everyone for participating in today's webinar. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event and a survey window will be popping up on your screen in a moment. Your participation is appreciated as it'll help us improve our further webinars. And I sent a link in your chat box. You can view the recording of this webinar there uh, when it's available, and you can also use that link to share with your colleagues. As long as they register there, they'll be able to see the archive as well. So thank you very much uh, today for the presentation. Uh, special thanks, of course, to our speakers, Vicki Gashweiler and Kirsten Wells. We hope that you found this webinar informative today. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.